All right, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, so I am Mikkel Hui. I am a full stack web developer. Uh, I come here from the delightful land of Switzerland. I've been doing Drupal for 10 years now. Um, and I'm for hire, hey. <laughs> Small block. Hi, everyone. Good to see so many of you here today. Uh, my name is Dick Olson. I'm a long time core and contrib developer. I love everything about Drupal. I'm born in Sweden. I live currently in the UK. Uh, I've been working nine years with Drupal, and I currently work at Pfizer. Um, really excited. Cool. So what have we been doing, and why have we been doing it? Um, so um, a bunch of really nice people uh, wanted me to uh, build an example of how a decoupled Drupal 8 site could look like. Um, we had a bunch of use cases we wanted to try and fulfill. Uh, one of the important milestones was offline capabilities. Uh, many websites can be had offline in, in basic ways, uh, where you can see a, a page you already loaded in a browser. Uh, but we wanted to try and push that a little bit, make it possible to use the entire site offline. Uh, so you, have, you could actually have the whole content on your phone or wherever, wherever else. And the reason for this, we're, we had a couple of scenarios for this. Uh, so imagine if you're a salesperson, uh, you sell for example, medicine for a living, and you travel around to doctors in rural areas, and you want to do a demo for them, uh, but the content you want to display them is not, you can't view it because you're, there's no edge or anything, or you're on GPRS and everything takes forever. Uh, so that doesn't really make for a good demo, so it would be really awesome if you could have your whole demonstration downloaded on your iPad or whatever. And similarly, if you're a doctor and you want to find information for how to use said medicine, uh, you know, dosage or whatever information you could imagine, and you're currently in a hospital and the hospital doesn't have Wi-Fi or radio devices are not allowed in the OR or imagine such scenarios, it would still be nice to be able to have at least some of, uh, some of the website information available. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that was one of our goals. Um, another interesting use case is to, to do more than just build websites with data. Actually take your Drupal data and build all sorts of crazy applications with it. We didn't actually do this, we just wanted it to see if it was possible. Um, another interesting use case is, you know, in these days where there's a lot of web exploits flying around and maybe it could be nice to have a Drupal backend that was only for your editors. So you have a site deployed to the web that's non-interactive, no one can log in and mess with it, it can't be defaced. Um, so with this, uh, as we're going to explain later, we, have, we found a way where you could put Drupal behind the firewall and have your content uh, rendered by these uh, decoupled apps. Another angle we wanted to try out was uh, building native mobile apps. Uh, the whole thing where you embed your website in a web view on your mobile phone, that works okay, but it has limitations, especially when it comes to performance and offline usage and that kind of thing. Um, so we, we experimented a little bit with that as well. We, so we chose a bunch of technologies. Um, we will explain them more as we go along. So I think Dick would like to inter uh, <laughs> Yeah. So first technology that we uh, obviously used. I don't think it needs much of an introduction, right? Drupal 8. But the really core piece of the Drupal stack was the deploy module and its dependencies. We call it the deploy suite. This is a suite of modules that enable you to replicate content between different places. Uh, these different places could be two different Drupal sites, but it could also be 
a Drupal site and another compatible application. We're gonna look into uh, more details here. Before we dive into more details, content replication is really hard. Moving content around in a consistent way between multiple systems is a really difficult problem to solve. There's all sorts of uh, latency issues, there's uh, conflicting issues, there's um, all sorts of trickiness. So what we've done in this stack of modules is that we've borrowed a lot of concepts from other projects, other systems, because we don't want to reinvent the wheel here. So the deploy suite consists of a couple of different modules. Um, not going to dive into a lot of detail here. We want to focus on sort of the decoupled uh, piece here. But the modules are multi-version. That's the base foundation. It's a module that enables revisions on all content entities for your site. Revisions is very, very important. Without revisions, you can't really solve conflicts in an efficient way. Any type of replication relies on having revisions in place. The replication module, quite self-explanatory. It deals with the actual replication bit and piece. Um, the workspace module, there's a lot to this module. We're not going to dive into a lot of detail here, but it's essentially enabling containers of, of content. You could have multiple workspaces on your site. You could have workspaces on external sites, etc. We could spend a whole another session talking about this module, um, but not today. Deploy module just adds a UI on top of this, which uh, Mikkel will demonstrate in the, in the videos later. And then finally, and perhaps the most important module uh, for the audience and for the topic here today, would be the relaxed module. So the relaxed module, what does it do? So it extends the REST API in core with replication capabilities. It's a REST API geared towards moving content around, replicating content uh, between different applications. We do this by borrowing concepts and the uh, specification from a database called CouchDB, uh, which we're going to talk a little bit uh, more about later on. Um, so how does these modules fit together? I've tried to illustrate this uh, in the best way I could. Um, so as we uh, said, starting in the middle on the left, multi-version is really the storage level, um, enabling revisions, stack of revisions for all content entities, being it node, nodes, block content, menu links, terms, etc. All content is contained in workspaces. Um, the replication module, is responsible for sort of lifting and shifting. Relaxed is the specification or the API we talk um, over the wire or over HTTP. And we can really talk to any compatible endpoint. Again, it could be another workspace, it could be a CouchDB database, or it could be other applications that Mikkel will touch on a little bit later. All of these modules, I should say not all, but some of these modules, uh, will be worked on and moved into core as part of the workflow initiative that uh, Dries announced during Tuesday's keynote, of which I'm the initiative coordinator. So that's a very, very exciting initiative. The focus for this in initiative will be content authoring and workflow. However, this initiative will enable a lot of what we will be talking about here today. It will lay sort of the underlying bits and pieces for doing replication and and for solving some of these problems. So check out the link uh, on drupal.org if you want to read more about this initiative. Again, not everything that we talk about here is going to be moved into core. Bits and pieces will, it's still uh, very relevant. So the next piece of the stack that we're going to touch on is a CouchDB. We talked a little bit about it. Um, so this is a database um, which is very, very native to HTTP. Every operation is done over HTTP, and the API is designed for doing content replication very easily. So uh, Mikkel will demonstrate how, how, this, uh, uh, how Drupal, Relaxed, and CouchDB fits together. So the next piece of the stack is something called PouchDB. 
so it's really cool that we have this database that's online. But what happens when we're offline? So PouchDB is a re-implementation of CouchDB, so P and C, um, and it works in Java. It, it's a JavaScript implementation, which means that you can run it in your browser. Uh, so PouchDB uses the browser's local storage uh, as, as its storage and simply is able to take your entire CouchDB database and replicate it down to the browser. Uh, so when, as soon as the replication done, you basically don't, don't no longer need an internet connection. You have your entire Drupal site content database available there. Or a more advanced use case we did not get around to try out, but it's theoretically possible at least, is to have a, a, a selective sync. So to say, you know, to this user whose name is Bob, I want to sync this subset of the database. So not only if, yeah, so maybe there's a lot of content that's not relevant to him, and maybe there's also content that he doesn't have access to see. But currently we're just syncing the whole lot and uh, hoping there's nothing secret in there. Uh, <laughs> well, there isn't since this is only for a demonstration. Um, and of course, uh, we chose to build this with React.js. Um, React is Facebook's take on the next level web uh, way to build web applications in the browser um, and other places, as I'll get onto. Um, the main revolutionary thought about React JS is to make things simple and unidirectional. Um, there's a couple of other web frameworks that I've worked with personally. I've worked with Angular uh, and Ember.js as well. And both of those tend to become very complicated applications. You have state going back and forth and two-way bindings and, and all sorts of craziness causing a lot of headaches. React.js is very is much simpler in the way it's designed. So you have components that can receive data, and generally components aren't allowed, or then recommended not to touch that data, but instead send messages out if they want that data changed by those who own it. And there's a couple of different met methods where this, by which, sorry, <clears throat> There's a couple of different approaches to, to solving that problem. One of them is Redux. Uh, Redux is what I like to call state management divinity. Um, so, oh yeah, I think. The whole, the main idea is this unidirectional flow. All your data state is in the so-called store. The store is just one big JavaScript object. Like it could be rendered as JSON. It has keys and subkeys. You can say my database connection is over here. The current user is over there. It's basically free for you to describe, but the key is that you only have this one central data structure. And it's only allowed, it, it's not supposed to be edited outside of the reducers. So the way it works is that any components, so the whole architecture around React.js is built around components. So your whole website is composed of these. So you have a username component uh, inside maybe the login component and you have all these components and they can ask to be given either the whole state or a part of the state, but they're not allowed to modify it. They're instead allowed to call actions, so-called Redux actions. Redux actions do something and then pass data to a so-called reducer. And the reducer is the only place that the store is editable. So in the reducer, so you can say, I logged in as user Bob, and then over in the reducer you get the user and Bob as parameters, and then you update the state with those, um, sorry, with those values. And 
everyone who has uh, who has access to the store will be notified, hey, the store changed. So you can now see, so if you have somewhere you're displaying the username, that component will now know that the username value changed. But the whole idea is that you have these selectors on the store, so if you have a component that does not display the username, you can ask for that component not to get the username. So each component will only get the data that's needed. And that means you don't have to re-render the entire page, you only have to re-render those components who ask to get the username. And that gives you a lot of efficiency because that's often the problem with uh, AngularJS and EmmaJS is that every time you touch something, touch data somewhere, the whole page gets re-rendered because no one really knows uh, where the data came from and, and what components it might have changed. <clears throat> so to give a short uh, overview of our architecture, so this is the simplest possible uh, example of, of what we've built. So you have a Drupal 8 site with your content on it, and you have the relax module installed, and then you have your web app loaded. So PouchDB can talk directly to relaxed, uh, either with syncing or without, so, and use that to, to provide your content to the React application. So the CouchDB example, what, which we will be demo, demoing here today, is a little bit more complex. Uh, here, instead of relaxed, in the middle we have CouchDB. So Drupal pushes its content to CouchDB, and from there it's available publicly to everyone who can talk to it. And the browser part is the same. And for our native app, you see we have the same architecture. Uh, the only thing that's changed is the bottom layer that we have now have a React native app rather than a browser-based app. <clears throat> so we have recorded a small demo. Let's see, full screen. Oh, let's restart. Where's the playback controls? Here we go. Okay, so we have all three applications here. Drupal, a React Native app in the middle, no, React Web app in the middle, and our React iOS app on the right. So if we go and edit the title here, so let's use a more intellectually sounding word. And if you're not familiar with Neo Drexelin, it's part of the Star Trek series. Uh, so this is not actual medicine. So here we push our content to CouchDB. And never mind the debug info. Uh, so let's see, did we get through to CouchDB? So now we look in our relaxed database. And we can see the document ID. We use UIDs everywhere. And if we look at the title, you can see now it says received rather than gets. And if we reload the web app, it will show the correct value. And similarly, if we reload the iOS application, it will also say receive rather than gets. Uh, so, so all these apps are hooked up to the same data store. So we learned a lot while doing this, uh, and allow me to elaborate. This combination of relaxed and PouchDB is totally awesome, in my opinion. Being able to have your entire website's database available in the browser, of course, there are some storage limits, so if you have a huge website, so if you have like 10 years of newspaper content, this probably won't fit in the, in the storage space you have, have available. But for many smaller websites, this is perfectly feasible. You can have up to 50 megabytes of uh, storage on the, on the phone, uh, on all phones, and even more on some phones. 
Um, and of course, this won't go far if you use images, but we imagine that the offline use case is, you know, it's acceptable for the user to not necessarily have images, but still have the whole website and all its content available, CSS and all. Um, that's of course, a, you could theoretically stuff images into CouchDB, uh, but uh, yeah, your, mile, your mileage might vary. In any case, I think this is a, a, a huge, huge thing. A small downside, or as we would say, significant downside, is there's, there's no easy features. Everything you saw in the React Native app, uh, or React Web app, well, you didn't see that much, but <laughs> it's basically been built from scratch. Uh, there's no, uh, so we have all the data from Drupal, but everything, all the links, the menu, the entire thing has been custom built for this project. This is, so I don't think this is something you'd necessarily do for any website, but it's something you might do for very important websites. Um, of course, when it comes to styling, you want to be able to just ship something off to your front-end designer somewhere. This is basically a completely separate styling process. Uh, React.js uh, has its own views on how you style, so you still use CSS, but you use it in slightly different ways. And especially when it comes to React Native, they have their own variant. It's kind of like CSS, but not quite, and you use Flexbox for layout everywhere, and it's, it's you're, I think your web developers might think it was a little bit weird. Another point which we got wiser to uh, as part of the process was there's actually very little reusability between the web app and the React Native uh, iOS app. So while the, so the thing you can, sh can easily share is logic, but our application doesn't have very much logic. But the whole display layer of how you lay out menus and things on the page will be completely separate because React Native uses native components and not HTML and CSS to lay out things on the page. So even though the technology is very similar, it's not similar enough to just be able to copy it over and, and go home. I would say on the upside though, the two technologies, React Native and React, uh, web, you know, the DOM, the web browser version, are completely similar in the language you use, the structuring you use. So your developers, you can easily imagine the same team of developers being able to do both, but it is still more effort. Part of this process, we tried to distribute a shared library using the latest JavaScript syntax and, and all that stuff. And that's still an area where where NPM and, and the tools we have are still a bit primitive. So I would just, a word of caution, it can be done and it is done and a lot of people do it, but it's not super easy. And I think that, that goes for a lot of this stuff. Is This is all very bleeding edge technology, especially when it comes to React Native. There's been a lot of changes and a lot of frustrations. So I don't have a lot of hair and I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily only because of this project, but <laughs> it certainly helped. So all in all, thank you for your attention. If anyone has questions, there's a microphone over there, so please step up to it. hear you, sorry. Uh, what protocol are you using to push to? Is this working now? 
Uh, what protocol are you guys using to push to Couch? Uh, so CouchDB has its own replication protocol, H HTTP based. Uh, so I think Dick can probably elaborate more. Uh, so I'm just filling the air and <laughs> get back up here. <laughs> so uh, the, the CouchDB defines a generic protocol for, for how you should move content over HTTP. Um, and there are many projects that reuse this protocol. It's very well documented and there is very little to no restrictions on the actual JSON payload. So the JSON payload itself, you are very flexible. Uh, it's very well defined on the HTTP level though, how the get requests, how the put requests should work, and, and what the various response codes should be. And, and then there's a whole protocol of what steps you need to take when you move content from one place to another. So it's a very well documented protocol. There's lots of SDKs for many languages, uh, which is one of the big benefits um, to have a standardized API as opposed to uh, just Drupal Custom, because there's not really many libraries to help you interact with the API. But since we're reusing a, a HTTP spec, um, that makes it a lot easier. Yeah, cool. Hi, uh, I kind of have uh, just two questions into one. So one is the first about a pouch DB. Uh, how long does this kind of sit in the browser? Is it like infinitely? And then the second question is uh, regarding security. How secure is this data if you're having like your entire site's database being stored in the browser? So as far as data retention goes, um, that's very much up to the browser. Uh, so it's like anything else that is cached in your browser. It could theoretically be wiped at any time. Um, although it hopefully wouldn't, won't be. <laughs> uh, and the second question, uh, sorry, uh, that was uh, security, yes. Of course, there's some security concerns um, when you have your, the entire content in the user's browser. Um, it shouldn't be too dangerous, uh, but you, of course, need to be take care that you don't publish anything that you don't want to publish. Um, so I think any realistic use implementation of this would probably have a uh, filtering in the data being pushed out. I think, did you do a proof of concept of that or? Uh, not yet. Yeah. Okay, not yet, but uh, we are like 99.9% .9 sure that this is the way to go. So you'd simply have a filter saying don't push unpublished content to CouchDB, don't push content with the tag X don't push all the user passwords. Uh. And, and, and this problem isn't necessarily unique to this particular setup. There's a whole ecosystem of tools around PouchDB and CouchDB that tries to solve this. Yet another reason why it's a good idea to tap into an existing ecosystem, uh, because there's a lot of tools around security, authentication that could be reused here. So that's quite exciting. Next question. Uh, you mentioned Redux and so PouchDB, is that, are your comp React components pulling data directly from PouchDB or is that all routed through Redux? It's routed through Redux. So we have Redux actions saying, get me all the documents or get me a document by ID. Uh, you could imagine any particular, so give me a list of documents with this tag name or something like that. You could define actions. So that's, that's how we've abstracted it. So we have this meta layer between Redux and, and PouchDB. Uh, and by the way, this, this code is open source. Uh, the link uh, there is, is to the Git repo that houses it, it, it all. And of course, feel free to ping me with questions if you want to try it out. It's still, we're still working on getting it nicely, nicely documented and everything, but um, yeah. Cool, thanks. I have a question about the performance. You said on phones you can go up to like 50 megabytes. So let's say your database is like 30 or 40 megabytes. Does that mean while that's loading on my phone I can't use it? Or is there server rendering? And what about like using up all that bandwidth? Um, bandwidth is, uh, so 
As from uh, from a performance standpoint, I haven't felt any effect from having all this content. It's basically it's stored in so because it's stored locally, it loads much 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 faster than anything. You know, just loading a single megabyte off the web versus loading 50 megabytes from local cache is much much faster with the local cache. Uh, of course, the bandwidth concern is there. Uh, so for the real world use case, we imagine that the the local storing would be optional. Uh, so there would be a place in settings you can go and say, please get me a, a local copy of this website. Or we might do it automatically for the most important things. Or uh, you can basically do it however you want. For for convenience, the current implementation just syncs everything as, as soon as the uh, app starts, but it doesn't have to be that way. Awesome. I've got one thing to add there, and I'm, I'm going a little bit outside of my uh, experience here, but uh, the, the latest version of PouchDB also works within service workers, oh, yeah. um, which means that a lot of the operations that PouchDB can do can be done very efficiently in the background as well. So you don't necessarily have to block the whole uh, rendering of a page while downloading. It could be done very efficiently. Um, that's not implemented in our POC at the moment, but that's uh, pouch to be certainly supports that. Next question. Yeah, oh, wait. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, just as far as the storage goes, the 50 megabyte limit is the worst case. So that is Safari on iOS that limits you to 50 megabytes. For example, most, uh, Firefox has no limits, and if you're doing React Native, there's also no limits, and different browsers have bigger limits. Because React.js is a JavaScript-based framework, do you guys have any issues with same origin policy? Um, yes, but uh, so in this example, CouchDB supports cross-origin requests uh, so, so actually, in this very demo, we have a cross-origin request going through. Um, Drupal has a course module, which would uh, allow us to do the same when talking directly to relaxed uh, to the relaxed API uh, rather than CouchDB. So, I don't think this is necessarily a problem. It's of course something that you need to configure for your sites. Uh, okay, and is there any specific type of authentication, or does it accept all? Um, so, th in this example, we use HTTP standard authentication, um, but of course, the danger there is that since this is a JavaScript application that runs in the browser, any password you have in there will be accessible to clever hackers. Um, so, in this, so for our use case, we uh, we're using something called Cloudant, which allows you to create read-only users on CouchDB, uh, and we're using those for that. So you can you can replicate the content down to your browser, but if you try to push updates, you will be denied. And the the API specification supports a base, basic authentication, a cookie authentication, and then OAuth, uh, of which we have implemented the first two. OAuth is still is still on the roadmap. Um, some challenges there, but there are many good libraries to use. Uh, not implemented yet, but yeah, that's that's certainly a possibility. More questions? Yeah. Hi, sorry, I, I come more from Backbone than React, but my question was just uh, your thoughts on a deeper integration between Drupal and some other MV framework. Like through REST, you can get definitions of all the entities, you could get menus and render arrays and all that. Could you foresee automatically constructing models in the client and views from that? It is something that we had as a concern with this project. So currently in our React Native application, we have implemented specific templates for each node type. So we don't have a generic way to render a node because we don't know what fields are on a node. So currently Relaxed supports synchronizing all content entities in Drupal but not config entities. And config entities is where the model for things are stored. Uh, it's certainly something that we have considered, but it's not something we could do right now. But it, it's interesting. So there's there's a couple of different uh, people and initiatives working on everything decoupled. 
uh, Sebastian or Fubi in the room here. Sebastian, do you want to raise your hand? Uh, he's uh, working on another React implementation that does support uh, server-side rendering, uh, where you could take more advantage of that. That, uh, that side of the coin does not um, support offline storage, so there's, like, there's a lot of different areas that touch different things, and perhaps there could be uh, efforts to sort of magic merge of all of them. I'm not sure, but there's, you know, there's different initiatives going on. What's what's the URL to your GitHub? Is it Fubi? Yeah, Fubi slash Drupal GitHub. So github.com slash Fubi slash Drupal dash decoupled dash app. <laughs> That's another uh, React implementation. Talk to Sebastian there in, in the blue shirt if you cool. want to know you. more about that. And of course, if you have questions, feel free to get in touch with either me or Dick on Twitter, or go hang out on Drupal Entity on IRC. And of course, visit our this delightful marketing website, drupaldeploy.org. Anything else? Other questions? Yes, uh, so the yeah. So, so the question was: If for your authenticated users, could you deploy to? Could you give them only the part of the website that's relevant to the to them? And yes, that's certainly a possibility. Uh, so, the relaxed um, module uses Drupal's own access control APIs. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Uh, so, you could use Drupal's API to limit what people can see via relaxed. And via CouchDB, you can write scripts on your CouchDB. I think that's JavaScript based. Uh, and those scripts can be used to determine what content gets synced to what users. Uh, so that's definitely possible. If there's user generated content um, and they're offline, is there a subsystem that like, will push that when they do connect to the internet? It doesn't happen. Yes, that, that certainly uh, would probably be possible. Uh, so. You would probably, in that use use case, you would need some comp some more complex uh, authentication logic for or authorization logic for the replication. So saying you're allowed to replicate comments but not new notes. Uh, but yeah. As as long as you write the uh, logic of getting the updates into the PouchDB storage, PouchDB and Relax will take care of the rest. So there's no, there's no, we don't have any components or logics to build the forms and to set that all up. But as long as you get it into the PouchDB storage, which is, you know, you can, you can do it quite trivially. Uh, you could also make, make it very complex for yourself if you want to. But PouchDB and Relax will take care of that for you. We have a full test coverage for that scenario. However, the components for actually writing into the storage doesn't exist. Uh, but the the other complicated bit of transporting and syncing when you come online, that's solved. Okay. One more question? So the question was, uh, how does the protocol handle conflicts? Uh, it handles it very well. It's, it's uh, one of the few databases out there that actually can do bi-directional replication very well. Um, so without going into too much detail, um, it tracks conflicts everywhere. Um, and it's always going to be up to the implementation to solve those conflicts. Because as the same with Git, there's only so much that you can automatically merge. You are going to end up having to interfere yourself and fix uh, conflicts. But the API and the specification marks and tracks conflicts everywhere, and they let you know when you introduce a conflict as well. More questions? Lovely. Is the offline storage encrypted? Is the offline storage encrypted? No. no. There are, however, additions. So yet again, uh, reusing Pouch2B, there's a whole ecosystem of tools here. Uh, I believe there are plugins and systems for encrypting the PouchDB storage. So things you get for free when you tap into an existing ecosystem like this. Okay, uh, please uh, rate our session. 
Um, it was lovely to talk to you all, and thank you. Yeah.